Common Sense Classroom, a series of insightful discussions about how the world works and why it works the way it does. Your host for this classroom series is Mr. Larry Abraham, a well-known journalist, historian, and public speaker. Mr. Abraham is widely recognized as an international expert on geopolitical affairs and has lectured extensively on the subject. In this episode of the Common Sense Classroom, Mr. Abraham will offer a new perspective on man's material progress by providing straightforward answers to the question, why are some countries rich and others poor? The reason some countries are rich and others poor isn't because one country is smart and another country's dumb. For example, let's look up here on the map. Here you have little old Japan and then great big old China. And Japan's one of the richest countries in the whole world and China's one of the poorest countries in the whole world. Now is there some invisible line that comes down here that says everybody on this side of the line is stupid and therefore has to be poor and everybody on this side of the line is smart and therefore are rich? I think not. Right down here in a little place called Hong Kong. Hong Kong in size is probably no bigger than the Bellevue area. And in Hong Kong, it's absolutely incredible how much wealth there is and right across the water, in fact, right up the peninsula seven miles, it's like going into a time warp and going back to the 13th century. Hong Kong's rich, mainland China's poor. Japan's rich, mainland China's poor. Another example, right down here, little old Singapore. Hardly a spot on the map. Very rich. Move up into India, grinding poverty. Let's explore why some countries are rich and others are poor. I submit to you, and I want you to write this down because this is a very important equation. We're going to deal with it all night long. MMP is equal to HE plus NR times T. MMP is equal to HE plus NR times T. Man's material progress is equal to human energy plus natural resources times tools. Now what does all this mean? What is man's material progress? That is the lifestyle that we enjoy. The fact that you're wearing Calvin Klein jeans as opposed to a loincloth. The fact that you go home to beautiful homes complete with uh, color television sets, VCRs, microwaves, live on a lake. Man's material progress is the lifestyle we enjoy. So everything relating to man's material progress is equal to this other side of the equation. Human energy, that's what the HE stands for plus natural resources times tools. Now, you know that if you're going to have the good life, you're going to have to work for it, right? Unless you just happen to fall into it, or your daddy's, you know, daddy war bucks, you get left a lot of money. But somebody had to work for it, if not you, your parents. Now, when it comes to working and expending human energy, if you worked seven days a week, 24 hours a day, the rest of your life, you're only going to be able to get so much done because there's a finite amount of time and you have a finite amount of energy, right? Now, when it comes to natural resources, natural resources are finite too. Now, we're constantly finding new ways to employ natural resources, but the coal, the oil, the gas, all the base minerals, all the elements, at some point in time you could say it's finite. What is the infinite factor here? The tools. Imagine if you were going to go out, say in your backyard, somebody said, 
like in the old Beverly Hillbillies TV movie, there's oil in your backyard. And all you have to do to get it to be big rich is get the oil up out of the ground. Well, now most oil's down about, you know, three, 4,000 feet. So you could shovel, but that'd take you a while. And you've got the natural resource down there. You know it's there. The best geologists in the world have told you it's there. The only way you're going to improve your material progress is if you get to use tools properly. You need a drilling rig, right? To get to the oil. And then when you get down, that's a tool. That pencil you're using, that's a tool. Stop and ask yourself, if you had to create that pencil from scratch, there were no pencils, but you wanted a pencil. You would have to go out and mine the graphite, chop down the trees to get the wood, uh, go find a mine to get the tin at the end, go tap into a tree down in the, in the jungle somewhere to get the eraser. You don't think about it, but that pencil is a marvelous tool. And it accomplishes much, just like the drilling rig accomplishes much. And when you use tools properly, you've got a finite amount of human energy, you've got a finite amount of natural resources, so how much material progress you have is in direct relation to the tools. You've all studied about early mankind out there with a lever trying to get a rock to, to roll downhill. Or that lever's a tool. Let me just give you one example of tools come to art form. Supermarket. When you walk into a supermarket, you're looking at one of the most marvelous expressions of this equation you will ever experience in your life. Oh, the human energy part? Yeah, that's understandable. The natural resources part? Yeah, it's all there. But it's the tools that provide for the supermarket. Everything around us is basically who develops the tools. Now, back to our question again. Why are some countries rich and others poor? Well, imagine, if you will, before you could do anything, before you walked into a classroom, this classroom, you had to check with somebody out there to issue you a pen. And if you were not one of the favored people to get the pen or the paper, in other words, if there was somebody controlling the tools, how much material progress would there be? As long as the tools can be the basis of man's imagination put to work properly, it's amazing what can happen. That's why, going back to our map again, when you look at very rich Japan and very poor China, the difference is who controls the tools. When you look at very rich Hong Kong and very poor China, it's who controls the tools. Now tools, like I say, can be everything. But it is who controls or doesn't control that makes all the difference in the world. Thomas Jefferson once said, if we were told when to sow and when to reap, we should soon want bread. The secret, there's another secret in this equation. People, being naturally lazy and always trying to find an easier way to get a tough job done, will develop tools on their own if you leave them alone. Most of the great discoveries in the world have been done by individuals just like you and me trying to find an easier way to get a difficult job done. And then ultimately we all become the beneficiaries of that person's imagination. Now, going back to the pencil again. When you stop and think what a marvelous instrument that pencil is, and how many people were involved in building that pencil? We don't know. We could speculate, but the numbers probably run into the hundreds, 
more likely the thousands, to produce a little pencil that we never even think about. And yet, what is it? All tools are what is called a capital good. We're talking economic talk here now, okay? All things either fall into what is called a capital good or a consumer good. The tool is the capital good, and what the tool produces is a consumer good. Case in point. A sewing machine is a tool, right? A capital good. The, fa the clothes that it produces are consumer goods. Now, when we get talking about, and you hear it all the time, are you for capitalism or against capitalism? Well, actually, the argument isn't, are you for or against capitalism? That's ludicrous. Everybody's for capitalism in one form or another. The question isn't, are you for capitalism or against capitalism? The question is, are you for individuals having access to tools? Or are you for central governments controlling the tools? That's the issue. Because everything is a capital good or a consumer good, whether we want it that way or not. Now, when we talk about capitalism, what is capitalism? Capitalism is financing the use of tools so that through exploiting natural resources, use of human energy, we increase man's material progress. Let's suppose you come up with a brand new gidget that is a marvelous thing that kicks out beautiful widgets, okay? You're a bright guy. You've invented it, but you don't have the money to produce it. So what are you going to do about it? You're going to have to find somebody who's willing to put up the money to produce it. In other words, you're going to have to find somebody who will provide money to develop your capital good. That's called capitalism. That's what it is. That's all it is. Now, what is it that the socialists talk about? They talk about a system from each according to his ability to each according to his need. We want everything equal. Show of hands, who's for equality? Well, let's think through that a little bit. Equality is a very elusive term. Equality of opportunity, yes. Should every person have the same right to pursue opportunity that every other person has, yes. But equality has some very interesting stumbling blocks to it. I would suspect if we were going to give a test here after this session tonight and grade everybody, A, B, C, D, E, or F, the whole range would be there. How many would believe, if that were the case, that everybody should be graded the same regardless of how they did on the test? Now, I don't think so. No more than everybody should be graded the same depending on how much human energy or how much smart they put into developing their own material progress. If I were sitting in the class just sloughing off, not even paying attention, and getting a D, maybe an F, and somebody else was really putting it to them, really thinking about it and knocking down an A, why should both be given a C? Pretty soon, the person who, who wants, who's going to give the effort to get the A is going to say, uh-uh, why bother? The same thing is true when it comes to developing an economic system. If you don't allow people to develop the tools, pretty soon they're going to say, uh-uh, why bother? And that's called competition. You see, you can look at it this way. Do you want equality or do you want competition? You want equality of opportunity, but you want the ability to compete in your own right. Now, when we talk about equality, 
you have this spectrum that's constantly being discussed. Left wing, right wing, and the debate on who controls the tools. You see, that's the only debate that ever goes on in economics. You can take all other debates and you can throw them right out the window. The only debate in economic systems is who controls the tools. There's one group of people who say that the state, the government, should control all the tools. That the government knows what's best, and so if the government controls all the tools, consequently everybody's going to get a fair share, right? Wrong. That's terrible wrong, because that's what creates the poverty. I've been to China. I've been on both sides. I've walked across the border. Drive up to the border in a beautiful Mercedes Benz, go across the border, and watch them plow the rice fields with an ox and a wooden plow. Because on one side they say, let everybody have a shot at developing the tools that they want to, and on the other side, the government says, the Chinese Communist government says, no, we shall control the tools. Now, how important is this? It's absolutely critical. Because you can have all the bright and all the smart and all the drive, and you can create all the tools, but if I can control them, I control you, right? If I control your human energy, and I control the fruits of your mental labor, and I also control the land which produces the natural resources, I control everything. I don't have to have guns to do it either. All I've got to get is people be willing to give me the tools. But most people say no. They don't want to turn over the fruits of their labor. So to go back to the debate, You've got one group over here that says that government governs best which governs most. From each according to his ability to each according to his need. We shall decide. Then over here, you got on the right hand side, you got no government at all. Total government here, no government there. Now, history seems to indicate that both of these are found wanting. And that the greatest good for the greatest number comes down somewhere along here in the middle, where government protects the individual's rights to the use, development, and implementation of his tools. And it makes for a very, very nice way of living. Without it, it can be very grim. So when you go on to college and you get into your economics classes, your economics professors may want to impress you with how smart they are, but remember this and remember it without any qualification. When somebody is preaching economics, always ask the question, who controls the tools? Because that's the rub. That's the essence of it. And as you go out of these classes and on to you pursue your education, remember there are two types of teachers that you will encounter. There are those who really want to teach you something, and then there are those who will want to impress you with how smart they are, and the net effect will be that if they can impress you with how smart they are, you will be so cowed, so afraid to challenge if they're coming up with a crazy non-common sense answer on this tools, you go along with it. What we're talking about, ladies and gentlemen, is basically common sense. I haven't told you anything you didn't know if you stop and think about it. Have I? I don't think so. It's all pretty simple. But when we get talking about sophisticating this, then we get talking about all the things that are going on around the world today. All the debates that rage in the halls of Congress, all the debates that wage in the parliaments of the world, they all basically are being waged over this one idea. 
Now, let's take it one step further to go back to our pencil and our supermarket. Do you think for a minute that all those things would be in the supermarket if all along the way there weren't people thinking they were going to make a profit by putting them there? The guy who grows the, the potatoes and raises the beef and cans the salsa sauce, it's all there because they see for themselves an opportunity to make a profit and get it into a position where you can buy it. How many of you have traveled, traveled abroad? Don't you miss McDonald's hamburger stores when you're traveling abroad? When I come back from overseas, the first thing I want to do in mar large part is to head for a McDonald's. <laughs> Why? Well, we, we grow up on hamburgers, but McDonald's is a classic example of this. Can you imagine what it would be like trying to provide all the component parts of a McDonald's store out of your own smart and your own resources? You couldn't do it. There's tens of thousands, millions of people contributing to the success of McDonald's. And all of them providing a tool that makes one of the steps along the way absolutely imperative. Without it, there wouldn't be McDonald's. Without it, there wouldn't be a QFC or a Safeway. Without it, there wouldn't be a pencil. Try imagine, if you will, trying to get all the ingredients into a McDonald's store if you were just working on it all by yourself. Raising the beef, growing the potatoes, mining all the ore that you'd need to make all the sheet metal to put in the kitchens, bringing the beef up, raising the potatoes, chopping them up. Impossible. It's ridiculous. When you stop and think about it, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, in fact, 7% of the entire workforce in the United States today contributes in some fashion or another to McDonald's. Now, this business of controlling the tools is so critical that we've seen examples where some countries that were very rich because the individuals control the tools are now very poor because they no longer control the tools. You've seen the pictures of what's on one side of the Berlin Wall and what's on the other side of the Berlin Wall. On one side, you have one of the fastest, most vibrant economic systems in the world, creating the most beautiful automobiles, Mercedes-Benz, Porsches, vibrant economy, and on the other side, <laughs> it's pretty grim. Czechoslovakia, for example, before the communists took over there in 1948, was one of the wealthiest countries in the world, one of the wealthiest countries in Europe. It had a system that allowed individual initiative, capitalism, free enterprise, as it were. Now it's a very, very poor country. So you can take poor countries and make them rich with this idea, or you can take rich countries that had the idea and had it pulled away from them and make them poor. And this is the essence of every struggle that's going on in the world today. Who controls the tools? I hate to keep repeating myself, but it's that important. Man's material progress is human energy plus natural resources times tools. And as I said earlier too, in the process of teaching economic systems, you can either teach or you can impress. If you're trying to impress, you may not necessarily be trying to teach. There's an old adage that says, those who can do, those who can't teach, and those who can't teach, teach teachers. Now, I don't think that that's always necessarily the case. But if I were trying to impress you rather than try and teach you something, I would be using a lot of language you wouldn't understand. Instead of talking about why some countries are rich or others poor, 
I'd be saying things like, let's examine the macroeconomic integration of the world's various economic systems and how they play out in the international infrastructure of world monetary affairs. What I say? What I say? You know what I said? I said, let's examine why some countries are rich and others are poor. That's virtually all I said. So when we get examining economic systems, don't be taken in by highfalutin words and charts and graphs. Use your common sense. You know, next to salvation, God's greatest gift to man is the ability to use their common sense. And the older I get, and the more I study, and the more I travel around the world, the more convinced I am of the value of common sense. Our education today is in many cases sorely lacking because it takes away common sense. What we need to do is take our greatest gift, the intellect, and buttress it with common sense observations, common sense applications, common sense equations that really make a difference. And let me just summarize by saying, before we get to questions and answers, do you know how important this is? I'll tell you how important it is. Within the lifetime of everybody in this room, some of us will either lose, lose our lives or lose a great deal of the fruits of our labor because of this struggle. That's how important it is. It literally affects everybody in the world. Where do you come down on one side or the other of this argument? Okay, let's now have some questions. Joseph? This uh, philosophy seems so simple. Why would a country willingly control all the tools and drive their economic progress you know, down and become a poor, a new developed country? That's a good question. It does seem very obvious. But throughout history, there's something else that's very obvious too. And that is power. If I wanted to control a country, if I believed that my, me, my friends, whomever, were smart enough to be able to build the type of state and society that we wanted so everybody would have to do what we said they, would have to do what we want them to do, then obviously I'd control the tools. As you look down through history, the lust after power is basically what we study in history. We'll get into that. Alexander the Great, the Caesars, Napoleon, Hitler, Stalin, Mao Zedong. At some point in time, the lust for power overrides every other consideration. I've been in the Soviet Union. I've walked the streets of Leningrad and Moscow. You don't have to convince the communists in Russia that their economic system doesn't work. Everybody knows it doesn't work. But they're not willing to make this change because if they make this change, they have to surrender their power. The Communist Party, the leaders of the Communist Party would have to surrender their power and the people having more economic freedom would have all kinds of other freedoms and their whole system of control would break down. So you see, in spite of the fact that this is obvious as to its benefit, the lust for power is the thing that stops it from becoming worldwide. Vanessa? Yeah, okay, you talk about the communist countries and stuff. You would think that the people who are unsatisfied in the countries, you know, who aren't a part of the political party, can't they overcome or like overpower the Communist Party? I mean, if they're so unsatisfied, you think that there's more of a majority of them? Unfortunately, that's not true. Because they know it's not working, but they don't have the power. 
the power vests with the people who have the guns. And so when you go to a country like the Soviet Union or China or any other country where this system is violated, what do you see happening? You see people long lines lined up to just get the barest necessities. But they're powerless to do anything about it because they don't have a gun. All the guns are with the people who will control the power. Big difference. Kevin. Yeah, I understand about the tools and everything, but uh, what about the people who aren't so fortunate who are you know, unable to help themselves? Well, that's a good question, because in every society, there are those who are more capable, obviously, just like in any classroom. You got the A students and you got the D students. Now, if somebody's a D student because they're a flake, well, then you can't feel too sorry for them. But if they're a D student because they just don't have the skills or the capability, then there's a place for helping those sorts of people. And that's where charity comes in. Let me give you an example. You all probably are very familiar with the parable of the Good Samaritan that Christ used in the Bible. Remember? The guy's going down, gets robbed, laying alongside the road. Few people walk by, don't pay any attention. The Good Samaritan comes along, picks him up, takes him to the hotel, puts him in the hotel and says, charge whatever you have to, I'll be back to pay whatever the overage is. Well. That's an act of charity. And charity has a very valid place in the structure of every society. But let me give you an example of how a lot of people consider solving that problem. Imagine, if you will, after the Good Samaritan did what he did, he then went off to Pontius Pilate, who was the Roman running the show around there, and said, OK, now I picked this guy out of the gutter, and I went and spent a couple hundred bucks on him. And, and nobody else really would do it. Now, I want you to pass a tax and tax all these people for their fair share of what I had to spend on this poor guy laying in the ditch. Okay? All of a sudden, the charity goes out of it. So what I'm saying is that when you have a very wealthy society and a very wealthy structure, people who do well have a moral obligation to help those who really can't help themselves. And that's how you solve that problem. But when the state gets involved in it, too often times, all you end up is spending an awful lot of money, and the problem's not getting solved very well in the process. Lee? When you're talking about how tools are the main item for power, why would some people voluntarily give tools up? I don't think they would unless they were forced to do it. Would you? Like back in the, like the revolution, the Russian Revolution, it seems like a lot of people gave things up then. Well, there were people who gave things up because they actually believed, and this happens a lot of times. People can get taken in. Somebody who's a very effective, persuasive dude convinces everybody that, look, you put all the, throw all your tools in this pot, bring in your guns, bring in your money, and then I'll make it equitable, and I'll see that everybody gets their fair share. Well, unfortunately, after Lenin and Trotsky and all the guys who pulled off the revolution got in all that control, they didn't do such a good job of seeing everybody got a fair share except a fair share of misery. So people occasionally get talked into this. But shortly thereafter, and it wasn't even a matter of just a few years, all of a sudden the revolt started, and then it was a matter of who had the guns again. Yeah, it was too late. Yes? I agree with you on the tools. If you take the, if the tools away, if a group controls the tools, um, they control pretty much uh, everything of the people. If you take the other two, like uh, human energy or the natural resources away, wouldn't it equally uh, control, uh, control? Yes, it would. There's no question about the fact that these are linked up together. The point I'm making on the equation is how the tools are so vital to bring these to full bloom, OK? You could still have the natural hu uh, resources and the human energy. The tools bring them to full bloom. But in the control factor, if you're going to go back and control, you first start off with the tools, but then you end up controlling these as well. And ultimately, 
You see, the terrible thing about power is it never seems to get enough. People can drink too much or they can eat too much and they get very disgusted with themselves, but power seekers never seem to get disgusted and they never seem to have enough power. And pretty soon, let me tell you how far this goes. You know what Karl Marx said? He said, our purpose is not to explain the nature of man. Our purpose is to change the nature of man. They even want to get around to playing with our heads and trying to literally play God. That's how far it will go once power gets on a real power trip. But it starts with tools and usually ends up over here. John, you had a question. Yeah. Now, you said that these guys, the leaders of the countries, <coughs> they know that their uh, economic system has gone down since they've started, they've taken control of the tools. Wouldn't they, if they, um, went back to the other way, couldn't they like get more power by uh, like giving them back there and trying to harness power that way? I mean, you know, they'd be knowing that they would have more power, a greater society if, you know what I mean? Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. You would think that the natural reaction would be, well, look, we've got a poor country, everybody's living hand to mouth, let's apply this and we'll have a rich country. And as long as I'm going to be on a power trip, I'd rather be head man in a rich country versus a poor country, right? right. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Okay. But what happens, in order for a country to become rich, the individuals in the country have to have the freedom to become rich. And if you give them the freedom, they're liable to throw you out. Oh, I see. You see what I mean? Yeah. So the risk for the power guy is Okay, it's miserable for these poor slobs, and I know that. But I got mine, and I would rather let them be miserable rather than surrender my power. That's the big question that's going on in China today, okay? With the so-called new economic theories and ideas in China. That's all this is. They have to allow some percentage of this because China was an economic basket case. It's still an economic basket case. When you compare China to Japan, it's like comparing, uh, well, I don't mean to be disparaging, but your high school football team to the Seattle Seahawks. Not in the same league, okay? Big difference. Elaine. Do you think that these people, like in the Soviet Union, are so um, used to getting less for what they do now that they've kind of like given up on themselves and given up on that leader that they, they think that they're to that point that there's nothing they can really do anymore? That's a very good question. And the answer to that is yes and no. There are some people who've given up. There are some people who quietly, very mutely, without complaining, go stand in a line when it's 40 below zero because that's all they've ever known. But interestingly enough, my experience was that most of them were the old people. You know what the young people are doing? The young people are out on the street doing deals. Everybody that approached me on the streets of Leningrad or Moscow was a young student, a college-age student, maybe even high school-age students. They want to deal in the so-called black market. Now you hear about black markets. What are black markets? All they are is basically the real marketplace, the one that's not controlled. So in those types of environments, you've got exactly that. You've got two types. Those who are willing to queue up because they've just, they're old, they're tired of fighting, they don't want to make waves. And you see that here too. You hear a lot of people saying all the time, well, I don't like the way this is happening and I don't like the way the government's doing this and doing that. But you can't fight City Hall, huh? How many times do you hear people say, you can't fight City Hall? Well, I guarantee you the people who've got the vested interest in keeping that myth alive are the people down at City Hall, right? As long as they got everybody convinced that you can't do anything about it, they win. But the young people there, it was different. Yes, Dirk. What I'm wondering is, I know we're 
us as a country, US, the United States is a powerful country. I know that. And I'm sure they have a lot of tools. And it's kind of obvious that tools are one aspect which makes a country so powerful. What are the basic tools in which we as a country, the United States, have? Like, is it the freedom of the people? Is that one? That, Dirk, is the most important tool of all. Because unless you have the freedom to use your imagination, to profit from your hard work, to exploit, if you will, all your human energy and your imagination, all the other tools are really not that much by comparison. So while freedom cannot be called a tool because it's an abstract idea, let's just say it's the mother's milk of all the tools, okay? Because without it, you don't have much. Freedom is the big equation. And that was the brilliance of what this system has produced. And Americans come from all points on the globe, right? We're a real melting pot. So in the United States, you sure have the breaking down of the idea that one group is smarter than another just because they were born somewhere else. That's nonsense. I've been from Africa to Asia to the Soviet Union and people are the same everywhere. Everybody wants the same thing. They want to better their lot in life. That's what they want. And freedom from government oppression, slavery, whatever name you care to give it, that's the way it happens. Without that, nothing else happens. All right, I understand that freedom is a pretty much obvious one. What, are, what other than freedom, what are the other tools? Well. There are other advantages. One of the advantages, of course, is that we live in a temperate climate, today notwithstanding, okay? The Greeks, philosophers, in a, hundreds of years BC said, those who would philosophize or think about how to make their life better first must eat, huh? Now, if you live in an equatorial area or a very cold area, you can be so busy just trying to keep body and soul together that you don't have a time to think about these projects. So if you take a look at the geography, as we will in our next class, you'll see how important some of those factors are too. Now granted, the United States is a rich country, rich in natural resources, rich in human resources, but it's not the richest country in the world. You know the richest country in the world is? a little country in Europe here called Switzerland. Small. Not everybody speaks the same language. They don't have any oil wells. They don't have any gold mines. They don't have most of the natural resources, but they sure got a lot of freedom, and they sure have a lot of tools, and they sure know how to use them, and Switzerland is absolutely amazing. Landlocked, no seaport, Compare tiny little old Switzerland to great big old Russia or great big old China when it comes to man's material progress, and you have a classic example of what we're talking about. Same way with Japan. Oh, it's a pleasant enough place, but they don't have any oil. Their natural resources are very limited. All they have is a great deal of freedom to develop the tools. Okay, to sum up, let's just go right back to where we started. Why are some countries rich and others poor? For all the reasons we've discussed tonight. And it really isn't much more complex than what we've discussed tonight. It all boils down to whether individuals like you and me have the right to use our human energy and develop the tools through the proper exploitation of natural resources that build for us a better way of life. If our system or anybody's system does that, then we win. But if it controls the tools, it will ultimately control everything else. And everybody in that country, that state, that culture is a loser. I wish to thank you for your very kind attention and your participation. 
This program is one in a series of programs in the Common Sense Classroom Collection produced by Soundview Publications. A printed transcript and recommended reading list is available for this episode as well as for others in the series. For more information, please contact Soundview Publications at 1-800-528-0559.